Eddie Kim, man, yes, thank sir. you so much for coming in, of boss. Of course, thank you for having me. Absolutely, yeah. man. You've had literally one of the most extensive careers across agencies that more than anyone that we've talked with so far. Mm, yeah. So if you want to give everyone just a, a bit of a run through, a bit of an intro of who yeah. you are and, and your work. Born and raised in California. Mm -hmm. I actually worked in the automotive industry um, before I moved out to New York working at Nissan, mm -hmm. um, primarily doing e-commerce and motorsports marketing and quickly realized that I had a passion in creativity, yep. um, really around like art, um, fashion, just culture in general. So it's kind of like the industry yeah. sort of took you, you know, you saw the other aspects of the industry of what it could offer. Exactly, creatively, yeah. exactly. I, I, it, was, it just amazed me that working in automotive, you still had opportunities to work with non-endemic brands that had nothing to do with automotive, yeah. you know? But yeah, just, you know, it was exactly five years. Yeah. Um, I believe it was during the recession of 2008. Um, yeah, right. yeah, it was really bad. Like, um, it got to a point where I was told that I needed to lay off about three people on my team. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. And at that point, you know, for me, I was like, okay, I, I had all these plans to move to New York mm -hmm. and to start something new and do something different. And maybe this is that moment because mm -hmm. if I lay myself off instead of three people on my team, mm -hmm. I can at least save one person's job and another person doesn't have to take a pay cut. Got you. So I just felt like that was the right thing to do. Um, and it also forced me to take the risk yeah. to you know, pack up all my shit and move to New York. Yeah. How old were um, you? 26, 27 years old. Yeah, and then like just kind of took a leap of faith and, and you know, I knew that it was a huge risk coming here without really having a network or knowing mm -hmm. a lot of people and not having a job lined up, yeah. it, was, it was a little scary. Um, but somehow I was able to, you know, um, I, I freelanced for, for the first year and just kind of built to build oh, a you, network. You came here without even a solidified job? No, I had place. no job prospects, oh, nothing. You know, I, I really didn't know what I, where I, I, like the whole goal of moving to New York was for me to be my own man and yep. stand on my own two feet and yep. do my own thing. And then when I got here, started just freelancing, doing just, you know, some digital marketing. Um, I worked with a barbershop in the Lower East Side that was actually much more than a barbershop. Um, there, back in the day, there used to be this media company called Frank 151. Mm -hmm. And through, really through having them as a client, it really opened up a lot of doors for me. So that's when I started my own thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just kind of went full steam ahead without really knowing what I was doing. Like the goal was really just to make really cool work, yep. you know. In, in what aspect was it? Production, like as a producer, or it was everything. So I was the I'm the I was the founder and the creative director, but we did everything that I personally had a passion for, which was everything from filmmaking yep. to technology to design and product development. Yeah, and then you know I somehow there was a recruiter and the can um, that was. His timing was impeccable. And when I say timing was impeccable with the recruiter from McCann, like he had reached out to me at the right time because in that moment is when I was starting to think about and come up with a strategy on how to get new clients. Mm -hmm. Because everything that I was doing from a marketing perspective was B2C, mm -hmm. you know, when I should have been marketing B2B. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I was doing that wrong. So it's like, I need to rethink how I'm, uh, how I'm showing up in the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, serendipitously, I got an email from this recruiter at McCann and he's like, yo, like, I've been looking for a guy or someone, not a guy, yeah, like, yeah. you know, a person who is fluent in technology, fluent in creativity and fluent in production. Mm -hmm. um, because McCann at that time was getting a ton of amazing briefs and RFPs that pivoted around technology. Mm -hmm. Was there a reason for leaving McCann at the time? Was um, it just better offer or was it more factors? Well, I mean, better offer, but the one thing that was challenging at McCann was um, there was a lot of, uh, not, not, not a lot, but there was one big broken promise that wasn't made, you know? And obviously that was to move for me to move up. Mm -hmm. and And also... While I was while I was you know content working there, at the same time I knew that I wasn't necessarily being challenged from the creative side of Got things. You. Yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Or even as a producer. Yeah. You know. So RGA came in and they promised like a much more creative role. 
they needed a freelancer to cover an executive producer that was going on maternity leave. Okay. And so, yeah, the idea was to come in, and it was really more traditional advertising campaigns, gotcha. right? Yeah. Like TVC, social, landing page, um, you know, print ads, mm -hmm. banners, doing the whole 360 campaigns, right? It definitely made me very impervious now mm -hmm. to any other client or account. I feel like I can, you know, I can pretty much manage any, any client yeah. on any scale now. Because um, Samsung was huge, and like there, and Korean culture, me being Korean, yeah. I understood the culture and knew the level of expectation and what they wanted gotcha. to too. Yeah. And they actually offered me a job when I told them I was leaving RGA. <laughs> you that's know, what, that's how crazy yeah. it was. And I think that's important as a producer as well too. It's it's not just about like being executional and and being tactical, mm -hmm. but also having the soft skills to be able to. Because at the end of the day. There's no production that I've that I've ran that went exactly according to plan. Yeah, yep. You know, it's generally Murphy's law. Mm -hmm. Like anything that can go wrong will probably mm -hmm. go wrong. You know, and if you have that relationship with the client, client 100%. will be more understanding. Yep. You know, and yep. so because the trust is there. So mm -hmm. I think that in this day and age, if you are working at a big advertising agency, working with big brands, mm -hmm. like it's only going to be beneficial for you to be able to learn and develop soft skills mm -hmm. um, with your producer skills. And do you think, how do, how do people do that? Is it more DNA or just being self-aware as well? I think it's a combination of both. I, Some people just possess that talent naturally. Mm -hmm. Some people tend to just know how to talk to clients yeah. and, and know what to say, know what not to say, and, and, and the right moments to say things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it's a skill that can be learned. Yeah. Like, Work partner with your account counterpart. You know, see how they do things, learn from them. Because um, at the end of the day, it's and this rule applies not just when you're talking to clients, but also within your own team. Mm -hmm. Is that in this day and age, it's not really about what you're saying, but it's about how you're saying it. You know, because mm -hmm. you can deliver the most worst news in the world, but if you deliver that message with malice. And, yeah. and negativity, it's not going to be received well. Yeah. But if you soften it up as much as possible, you know what I mean? Like the, the, the reaction you're going to get, is main, it, it's probably mm -hmm. not going to be as bad. And I guess know? as long as you feel, it feels like you're on the side of, of finding an answer and mm -hmm. you're not being malicious about it. Like, mm -hmm. yes, it is a problem, but it's like, you know, it's our problem that we're going to work and exactly. navigate through. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, I think that's, it's, it's an invaluable skill in my mind. Um, and I think that if you want to go far, in your career, it's, it's something that you should think about. Mm -hmm. What are those challenges or conversations that have changed in the last like decade of mm -hmm. that you've been working in the industry or, or even the last few years? I think that the most drastic change I've seen is in the past few years. There are a lot of big holes right now. Mm -hmm. You know, like um, a typical media agency, while they may be able to do your media buying for your TVCs and your banner placements and things mm -hmm. like that, but what about on Facebook? What about on TikTok? What about on Instagram and Snap and all these things, which um, a lot of the bigger media agencies that have been around for a long time, mm -hmm. like they focus, they focus a lot more on the bigger buys, you know? And I think that they're now transitioning to also look at the, the social mm -hmm. aspects of things because I think social, like, you know, when you put out a TVC or an at-home or a print ad, like yeah. you're not getting any data back. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like a publisher can come in and tell you, oh, you're going to get 500,000 yeah, impressions. Yeah. You know, but all right, what's the conversion rate? Yeah. You know, like you can't track that. Yeah. The only way you can track these things and get data back to make more informed decisions about your advertising is mm -hmm. through social. You're almost forced in a position where you have to show results. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's the value. Like even if you can't convert, to be able to get that data back to sh see what's working and what's mm -hmm. not working is value. Yeah. You know, you can't get that with a print ad. Yeah. You can't get that with a TV commercial. You know what I mean? Like, it, like you're going off of impressions based on an old, you know, system that is really at this point, like it's it, it's it's just old school. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to because we didn't even get to. This is the problem with connecting with someone on LinkedIn that yeah. has. 17 pages of a huge <laughs> career of highlights. Um, is that it takes 45 minutes to go through the highlights right. of their career. I was at Co Collective for a little over a year, and it was a really, really small agency, only 20 full time employees. Mm -hmm. um, it was very valuable for me because I learned a lot from a strategy perspective. From, and I'm not talking about 
strategy at the campaign level. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about strategy at the brand level, at the yeah. highest level. And you know, they hired me as a he their head of production because they wanted to transition from being a strategic consultancy that just thinking work mm -hmm. into a organization that is also creative. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about um, going from a place like a global agency like mm -hmm. McCann that's been around since the dawn of mm -hmm. time to somewhere that's obviously smaller. Um, tell me more about just that contrast between the two and like how, how did that feel on a day-to-day -day basis? Like how do you carry yourself? It's, you know what, I was never, I was never shy to be who I really am. Mm -hmm. You know, um, at McCann, it was a little bit, there was, there was not a lot of diversity in McCann at that time. No, I maybe, imagine not. Yeah, yeah, like maybe it might be different now, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Culture matter because, like, you know, if you're producing a spot for like Beats by Dre, which is heavily influenced by by Black culture, mm -hmm. you know, it matters who the creatives are in ideating that concept because they understand that one, culture. No, one hundred percent. You know what I That's... mean? Like, like only someone who's Black is gonna understand. Like, when I comb my hair, it may not be yeah. you know like it's going you're going to get a certain result yep. because you're black because mm -hmm. like people have different hair you know like and those nuances are only going to be understood by the people in that yep. culture which is why these things matter you know but is there anything you miss about being at a global agency yeah i mean like the way that we operate is a lot more a lot more clean cut mm -hmm. you know there's more process and rigor more order mm -hmm. there's also advantages of being at a smaller agency you know decisions get made faster yeah you can be more nimble you can be more agile mm -hmm. you know so there's good and bad to both it just really depends on where you want to be mm -hmm. yeah. um what are some of the questions that people can expect to get asked like at, at your level when you're taking on or get an offer mm -hmm. and you're going through negotiations you're going through interviews mm -hmm. for a new position that hiring process what are some what are questions that people can expect to get asked it really varies on what the role is. At, at, like at the level, it's at the level that I'm at. It's not necessarily about can you do the job. Yeah. If you're on in an interview, they already know you can do the job. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? They already know you qualified. Mm -hmm. Now it's more of like a vibe check, chemistry check. You know what I mean? Like like are they going to be good with my team? Yeah. You know like. Do we uh, do our vision and creative taste of like, like at Nike? Yeah. I was asked like, "Oh, who's your favorite photographer?" Uh, you know, yeah, and yeah, yeah. then I was like, "Oh, pff, no brainer, Ansel Adams." Yeah. You know, and then I think her response, she was looking for something more of the long lines of like, "Oh, like a Dave LaChapelle yeah. or like you know what yeah, I mean?" Like it's like you know like so there was some creative differences there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I like clearly Ansel Adams more landscape nature mm -hmm. type photography, old school black and whites. Whereas in like, I mean, shit, you got a David LaChapelle yeah, right. photo right there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Completely different, yep. you know, more, more modern, contemporary, new age, you yep. know? So like, it's, it's really more about like the, I think the personality nuances mm -hmm. that they're looking for to see if you're going to be a right fit and the chemistry yeah. is good. Um, and the other thing is like, are you a leader to be able to lead people mm -hmm. to, um, to uh, through the project? You know, I think it's uh, you know as a candidate trying to apply for a job at an agency, it's just you know, like like showing your individuality is going to be important. Mm -hmm. You know, leaning into your culture is going to be important, especially mm -hmm. now in this day and age. Um, you know, and overall, just speaking confidently. Mm -hmm. To be honest, you know, like. You, I think, assertive, like in your own value, like if you know you've got value to bring. Yeah, I know that not everybody is great at interviewing or public speaking or mm -hmm. being able to present in a room mm -hmm. of people, you know. But if you are truly passionate about what you do and you speak from the heart of that passion, mm -hmm. it's just going to come out naturally, you know. Mm -hmm. And when people see your conviction and passion, they're going to believe you and they're going to follow you. Mm -hmm. So like I think that's really what's going to be the most important, and then you can get into like oh yeah you know your past experiences, your education, or whatever. How yeah. important as um, not for someone that's that's owned their own um, studio before, mm -hmm. but people that are coming out of college and, and university, mm -hmm. and how important is their folio of work? These oh, days? It's, it's so important. Yeah, it's so important. Like I think um, like doing things for free, finding mm -hmm. their own projects. Oh yeah, whether it's a real client or not, like. Mm -hmm. Literally, just find something and make it. Yeah, if you're at a point where you need, you're just starting out. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, the reality is you need to prove yourself. Yeah. You know, um, and whether that means that you need to go and make something for free, mm -hmm. 
and put it out to, for the world for people to see. I can't speak for every hiring manager out there in the creative space, but the first thing I look at is portfolios and resumes. Yeah. If you don't have nepotism going mm-hmm. on, like if you're not hired because you're the best friend or yeah. something, um, you have to, you literally, you either give up mm-hmm. and don't get hired by anyone or you go out and put in the work. It's yeah. the same in our field. Like I feel like anything in creative mm-hmm. or production, like you have to be making it. Oh, like, yeah. And that's one thing I always took, like when I've, I, d- I didn't even finish my de- degrees. I did mm. a music d- degree, didn't mm. finish it, interned. Mm. And I was like, I'm not going to sit around and wait to get hired. Yeah. Like It was like, I'm going to literally live on nothing mm-hmm. and move into back of my mom if mm. I have to and then literally work for free yeah. until I'm going to make something that someone's going to pay for. Yeah. And uh, yes, p- I think people do, can come out of university and college mm. with like just blind and expect yeah. they're going to fall into a position. Yeah. I mean, like aim high. I mean, I, I would go as far as like, like think of like the brand that you want to work with the most Mm -hmm. and go make like a fake commercial. Yeah, You know what I mean? Like just just do, you know, something to get on the map or to get people to notice you. you Because making things and actually putting it out into the world says a lot about who you are, you know, and that you're willing to take risks, you know. What are some of the biggest, like biggest hurdles and challenges that with clients that you're trying to navigate through these days? (laughs) My biggest challenge right now is... Not necessarily the environment that are that we're in. It's just, it's constantly about tight timelines. Getting asked to, you know, design three different look and feels for a major campaign over a weekend. Yeah. You know, it's like, what kind of, like, like what kind of quality do you expect with that little yeah. time? You know, but. At this point in my career, I really know how to manage and mitigate those situations, you know? So, like, it's not quite as bad. Mm -hmm. As long as you clearly communicate and caveat early Mm -hmm. and say, like, hey, listen, if we don't have this deadline by this date, then either the schedule is going to get pushed back day for day that we're Mm -hmm. late or it's going to cost X amount of dollars to meet the same deadline because we need to bring on more people. Yes. You know, so yep. it's like the way I frame it is never like, oh, we're never going to be able to make it. Like you yep. guys met, the, you guys missed the deadline, so yep. we're not going to be able to do it. You yep. know, it's like no. And coming with solutions yep. with like a positive attitude is going to get you really far in yep. those types of situations. You know, that's what I've learned. Um, and it could just comes down to clear communication, like yeah, a lot of communication as yeah. well. Like I, I came from like. That's one big thing I've been working on even the last mm. year. Like I feel like we're me and the client are on the same page. Mm-hmm. Like we understand, but something will happen or, that they didn't really see coming, mm-hmm. and or they just they didn't know how to handle a change mm-hmm. on their end, mm-hmm. and then I didn't know how to re- sort of re- respond mm-hmm. to it as well. So something I'm just trying to w- work on is yeah, just mm-hmm. communicating further. Mm-hmm. If this thing happens, it's mm-hmm. not over communicating. It's mm-hmm. like the right amount of yeah, communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's funny because over communicating has become. A recent philosophy of mine because of remote working. Right. Ever since we went into lockdown and we all had to remote work, uh, work remotely, I, I started to quickly learn that like communication is not flowing like it used to in being in the mm-hmm. same office in the mm-hmm. same room, you know. And that's why over communicating, I mean, amongst your team yeah. is is I think a requirement now. Maybe not to the client, mm-hmm. but yeah, within your team. Yeah. Um, I mean, clients wise, client wise, like you know. If there's a threshold for us to be able to still meet delivery dates, even if the client's a little bit late, mm-hmm. we're gonna do it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it's at the end of the day, like, you know, your marketing budgets are paying for our salaries. You yeah. know, so like, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to appease you and and at the end of the day you're coming to us for a service mm-hmm. and I want you to be happy with that service. But other times there are realities. For for people that are in our position as a as a production company, mm-hmm. what and like seeing that you've you've had your own studio and production company, you you've seen the agency side. Mm-hmm. What did you what did you realize that agencies want to see from vendors like like us mm-hmm. to get them hired? I think what was help, really helpful for me, and it's funny, I didn't really learn about this until I was at Co Collective, but um, in this business, awards matter, right? What does awards awards yeah awards matter? In the end, clients are going to be attracted to that new shiny thing, mm-hmm. you know, that like that that's really hot and trending right mm-hmm. now, you know. And winning awards expresses that mm-hmm. for you. There's a creative production awards called Le Book, L E B O O K. I would I would recommend you to to probably look into that yeah. and submit to these things, these other award shows that yeah. you can to kind of get on the map, because when 
these are when these awards happen, it's not. And ever since um, we've come out of lockdown, it's no longer done virtually. You would have your own vendor booth. Yep. There's potential clients that come through the door. A lot of the people that are judging the work are high-level people from from huge companies. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like, that's one way to get no, noticed. Well, that's one way to get on the map. Got you. Now yeah. you have to get noticed. Yeah. You know because there are a ton of other production studios just like mm-hmm. you that are that are doing the same exact thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like, how do you, how do you, how are you differentiating yourself? Yeah. Other than that, like you know, doing things like this, like your podcast. Yeah. I don't know any production studios that are doing their own podcast. Yeah. You know. Um, and then just being consistent about putting out work, whether it is billable client work or not. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Um, and that's going to take an investment on your part. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes like, hey, like, you know, someone on your team wrote a great script, mm-hmm. but maybe you don't have the right gear to shoot it. Mm-hmm. You might have to invest to rent some stuff, you know, or you might have to invest to, you know, secure permits or a location, mm-hmm. you know, like at the end of the day, like the greatest investment you can make is into yourself, Yeah, you know? Um, and the more you do these things and do the work and put it out, someone's going to see it, mm-hmm. you know? And so, yeah, that's like the best thing that I can Love say. It. It's like, it's just follow your passion. All right, we're going to do some rapid fire questions. Yeah, 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 of course. That you have no, know nothing about. <laughs> right. It should be fun. So they're going to be deep. Or, or not at all. What is one thing you regret spending money on? I, I can't believe I'm even going to say this, but... <laughs> um, so last year... I bought no in twenty twenty at the end of twenty twenty two. I bought my dream car, and as I'm becoming more financially educated, I'm learning more and more that I shouldn't have bought that car. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yeah. so that is a regret. <laughs> but when I drive it, it all goes away. So okay. what dish do you cook best? Easy. That's Korean food. Yeah, and and that's literally just cooking rice because yeah. all the side dishes that you that comes with that yeah. like. There's no way I would be able to actually make all of that, yeah, and yeah, that could yeah. all be store bought. So, like that is probably my wife and I's signature go-to dish. Do you make your own kimchi? Or anything nah, like that? No, 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 no. I would, I would no. never make my own kimchi. That's 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 just that. Yeah, that, that would take a lot, a long time <laughs> that I just don't have. Um, and it's gonna be like, I can't believe you asked me to use the fucking kimchi. Um, all right, what is your guilty pleasure? It's a vice that I have given up yeah. about a month ago, which is smoking cigarettes. Nice. Yeah. Congratulations. That's Thanks. huge. Yeah. What are th- three things you can't live without? Um, I'm a huge coffee person. Mm. Weed. Weed is the second thing. Yeah. Probably my phone. I hate to say yeah, it. Yeah, you trip. Yep. Yeah, but uh, unfortunately, I hate to say it, and I, yep. I hate that I'm saying it. But, disgusting things. <laughs> but, but my phone, like, I it's can't. It's so true, you know, though. Yeah. It's tough, especially with what we do. Yeah. You know, it's like, an hour without your phone, it's like, yo, like the whole yeah. world can go by. Yeah. You know? Now, what's a what's a trend you would like to see disappear forever? I, I there's a trend in fashion that I really don't like, which is this whole nineties aesthetic yeah. thing. Cause yeah. I grew up in the nineties, you know what exactly. I mean? So yeah. like, you know, yeah. it's like seeing all this stuff come back yeah. and to see that the younger generation thinks that it looks good. Mm-hmm. It, like it just tells me like like maybe my taste is is dwindling yeah. or, you know, or I'm just a fucking old guy now, you know. Like I don't, I don't know. But like, you know, <laughs> um, when you were younger, what did you, you envision your profession being? I always answered that I want to be a dad. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Different nice. mixed emotions about it now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's one thing you always wanted to try but you've been too scared to do? Um, Fuck, these are deep. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> This is for really for the sake of my wife, and that's taking more of a risk to try seafood. Okay, because I'm not yeah, a big yeah. seafood person. No, neither. Um, and you know, I know that it would be more enjoyable for her if we can go yeah. to the same place and eat together. Yeah. You know, so take it. But I also have an allergy to shellfish. You know, so it's right. like you know, so yeah. it's not for no. It's not just because I don't like it. So, <laughs> so what's one thing you always wanted to try, but you've been too scared to? Is cod. <laughs> well, it, I would probably say like lobster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, if you couldn't work in in this industry, what profession would you pursue? It's probably secret agent and entrepreneur. <laughs> Love yeah, it. fuck yeah. Um, last one. What's something you notice about someone the first time you meet them? I can just look at someone's shoes and get a good idea oh, of what kind of person they are. Damn. Damn. I can like I so, look at the shoes. Yeah. The first thing I look at is shoes. And then how how what their attire mm-hmm. looks like, you know, and then their disposition, yeah, and just body language, and that'll pretty much tell me everything that I need to know from 
at a surface level. Yeah. You know. <laughs> All right, man. This is so we're gonna end these podcasts with yeah, yeah, yeah. a question that the guests ask the audience. Mm-hmm. So it could be about anything, it can be to anyone, it could be mm-hmm. the most random thing, it could be yeah. the deepest thing. What are you willing to do and how far are you willing to go to manifest your dreams? You know, because nowadays I see and hear a lot of kids talking about what they want to do, mm-hmm. not putting in any effort mm-hmm. and thinking that things just happen overnight. Yeah. You know, a lot of times they just see what happens at the finish line and not the work that gets up to the finish yeah. line. Yeah. You know, so like, are you going to be disciplined enough? Mm-hmm. You know, are you going to be, do you want it bad enough where it's like you're working seven days a week mm-hmm. to get it? You know, you're working nights to get it. Mm-hmm. Like, whatever you have to do to get it. So my question to your audience is really is like, how far are you willing to go? What are you willing to sacrifice in your life to make your dreams come true? Love it. Yeah. Andy, thank you so much <laughs> yeah, for that. Of course, man. <laughs> that was the fucking deepest podcast we've had yet. Ah, And I so. love it. I <laughs> Glad to be it. here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.